Good evening, I'm Forrest Sawyer, and this is ABC News Thursday Night. A very sick little girl in need of a miracle. I tended to think that more than likely she was going to die. And suddenly, against all odds, an unbelievable turnaround. Something happened. I don't think it was medical. I don't have an explanation for her recovery. Do you believe it was a miracle? The Catholic Church believes it may have been just that. If a miracle is a miracle, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And now she is the unlikely candidate for sainthood, a Jewish woman who became a nun and died at Auschwitz. That, that was a big thing, that we had all prayed to this time. How do you explain the unexplainable? Tonight, Elizabeth Vargas on the making of a miracle and the rocky road to sainthood. Whether or not you believe in miracles, you may be surprised to learn the Catholic Church says there have been thousands of them. Tonight's story focuses on what some are calling a real miracle with an unlikely combination of characters. A Jewish woman wants an atheist who is about to become a saint, and a little girl in Boston who believers say may be alive because of her. Elizabeth Vargas is here now with this remarkable story. Elizabeth. Forest every year, thousands of Americans go to places like Lourdes in France and Medjugorje in Bosnia, all in search of miracles. But do miracles really happen? We spent the last few months investigating, traveling from Boston to Rome to find out what it takes to make a miracle. Ken Woodward, the religion editor of Newsweek magazine, is at work on a book about miracles. The Catholic Church is very interesting in this regard. They accept the fact that miracles happen. But they're very wary about saying this was a miracle. Prove it. The Roman Catholic Church is the only major religion with a strict system of rules and regulations for proving miracles happen. Through rigorous investigations that sometimes take decades, the church believes it can distinguish the merely incredible from the truly miraculous. We have experts in medical matters, experts in theology. We have experts in archival and historical matters. Of the thousands of claims the church investigates, says the Vatican's Monsignor Robert Sarno, only a handful are declared official miracles. If a miracle is a miracle, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And in fact, they are almost impossible to believe. Consider the story of one family living just outside Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> At first glance, they seem like an ordinary Catholic family. They play together and pray together. But the McCarthys aren't exactly like other people. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. For one thing, the father, Charlie, is a Catholic priest. In the Catholic Church, in the eastern part of the Catholic Church, priests have always been allowed to marry. So I am part of the eastern rite of the Catholic Church, which is under the Pope. Not every family has a chapel off their living room either, where every Sunday dad says mass for his wife and 12 kids. Several of the children are named after prominent Catholic figures. Kateri, in honor of a Mohawk Indian who converted 300 years ago. Bernadette, after a French saint who lived in the late 1800s. The youngest is Benedicta, named after a German nun who died during World War II. And some are now calling the story of the little girl and the nun she was named after absolutely miraculous. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit now and always. It began in 1987 when two-year-old Benedicta watched as the flu swept through her family. Everybody needed the Tylenol, you know, at different times. And, you know, people would just say, oh, where's the box of Tylenol? And then it's like, well, maybe it's up in our parents' room. Or, no, I, I took it and left it uh, in the bathroom. It was really unmonitored. The McCarthy parents were out of town when the older children noticed something was wrong with Benedicta. I remember going up to my father's study and, uh, and taking a look at her. I started trying to play with her, and uh, she was just so limp and floppy, and uh, usually she was so active and wanted to play. 
I remember Kristen coming in and saying, you know, it's like, oh, maybe we should take Benedict to the hospital. An ambulance rushed Benedict to Massachusetts General Hospital. By the time Charlie and Mary McCarthy arrived, Benedicta was in intensive care. When we got to the hospital, um, a nurse said that uh, they had just discovered that she had an overdose. I think they said it was something like 18 to 19 times the lethal dose of Tylenol. 18 to 19 times the lethal dose? Yes. Poisoned by the toxins coursing through her body, Benedicta was in critical condition. She was intubated. She had multiple lines. She was on medication to support her blood pressure, getting multiple blood products. That, that night was just hell. I mean, she was fully conscious, but she couldn't move any muscle in her entire body. She couldn't even open her eyes. And so she was just kind of lying there. How frightening was that? It was very frightening. I remember simply trying to uh, sing to her, talk to her. Dr. Ronald Kleinman, head of pediatric gastroenterology at Mass General, was in charge of the case. She was moving towards being comatose, actually, uh, and her blood work showed that uh, her liver was sick and probably getting sicker. Pediatric intensive care. Just kept getting worse and worse. Every bit of news, even the little ones, were all bad, all bad. The McCarthys needed a miracle and they were praying hard for one. But they didn't appeal only to God. They began to pray to Benedicta's namesake, Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. As Catholics, we believe that certain people, um, they sort of have this in with God, you know? And, and, then, and, and they, they sort of have uh, a special uh, gift uh, for answering people's prayers, you know, um, for, for helping people out. The person they sought help from had been dead for over 40 years, but her story was very much alive to the McCarthy family. Sister Teresa Benedicta was born Edith Stein on Yom Kippur in 1891. A German Jew, she was raised in a large family. Scholarly and precocious, by age 13, she declared herself an atheist. She was one of the first women ever to receive a doctorate out of the German university system, and she received it summa cum laude. She was just a brilliant person. But when Stein was in her 20s, a beloved friend died, and she was struck by the comfort his family drew from their Catholic beliefs. This started Edith on a spiritual journey that eventually led to her conversion. Her faith grew, and in 1933, she joined the Carmelite Order of Nuns, just as the Nazis were taking over Germany. Though Edith Stein was now a Roman Catholic, she was still a Jew to Hitler. In 1942, she was killed at Auschwitz. She is said to have gone to her death for giving her persecutors. Her name is Sister Theresia Benedicta. That was Edith Stein. Father McCarthy, who'd spent years teaching nonviolence, was drawn to her story. He believed that Edith Stein was in heaven with God, and now two-year-old Benedicta needed her help. I thought we'd create a prayer tree. You start with a few telephone calls to a few people, and you ask them to pray, and ask them also to call other people to pray. But I don't think it was until afterwards that I realized that they had been asking a lot of people to. I mean, like the 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 sheer numbers of people, you know, that they were asking to pray for Benedict at that point. The dying girl would need all the help she could get. And at this point, doctors were saying she needed a liver transplant. Even if they were to obtain a liver, there was only a 50-50 chance of her survival. She was top priority on the transplant list, but it might take weeks for a healthy liver to be available, and time was running out. In your heart of hearts, did you think she was going to survive, or did you think she would die? I thought that she was going to die. I tended to think that more than likely she was going to die. I don't think anybody thought she was going to make it. With his daughter close to death, Father McCarthy found himself in a terrible dilemma. He was scheduled to lead a religious retreat a thousand miles away that weekend. And so the question arose Sunday, do I give the retreat? or do I stay with Benedicta, knowing that in all reasonableness, she was dying. 
And I remember coming back from the hospital. There was just a book on the floor open. It was a writing by St. Teresa of Avila, the same person that Edith Stein read about when she made her conversion. And the sentence that jumped out from the book to me was where Jesus said to her, you take care of my business and I'll take care of your business. For whatever reason, I took that sentence as speaking to me and I went and I gave the retreat uh, for people in North Dakota. But when I left, my sense of the thing was I could very well never, never see Benedicta again. You know there are a lot of parents who would never and could never understand your decision to leave your daughter that morning. Benedicta was named after Edith Stein because Edith Stein represented everything that I had been teaching for 20 years. And therefore, there was an internal logic to being faithful to what had to be done in the moment and that God would take care of everything else. What they say happened next was certainly unbelievable. Some now say miraculous. The retreat finished 1 o'clock North Dakota time, which is 2 o'clock Boston time. And as I remember, at 2 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, uh, someone wrote in the medical records, this child has made a remarkable recovery report we'll have to follow. Something happened. I don't think it was medical. <laughs> no flash of lights, no auras of any sort happening. Um, it happened quietly <laughs> in the midst of a very busy unit. I remember very explicitly when Benedicta walked out of Massachusetts General Hospital at two years old without an ounce of medication with a balloon, she walked to the elevator, pressed the button herself, and all I could think of is, there goes the glory of God. Benedicta got her miracle, and her patron, the Carmelite nun, Edith Stein, was on the road to sainthood. But you may be surprised to find out just what it takes to become a saint when we come back. The Catholic Church has a tradition going back almost 2,000 years of believing you can pray to souls in heaven for favors here on earth. And those who intercede with God to cause miracles are the ones the church calls saints. But the church doesn't name saints or proclaim miracles easily. It's an exhaustive process that can take years, decades, even centuries. Even Mother Teresa, whom many called a living saint, has a long way to go toward sainthood. Well, there is no such thing in the Catholic Church as a living saint. It's a contradiction in terms. All saints must be dead. Yeah, it's one of the drawbacks of being a saint in the Catholic Church is that, that, uh, that you've got to be dead. But even upon her death, Mother Teresa was not proclaimed a saint. Church doctrine requires a five-year waiting period before the formal investigation of a person's life can begin even with one considered as selfless as Mother Teresa. Do you think Mother Teresa will be made a saint? Yeah, but I, you know, okay. Um, the problem with Mother Teresa, it seemed to me, is that everybody kept talking about her as a saint. So one has to prove that she didn't start believing this herself. I suspect she was too busy. Like all potential saints, Mother Teresa's life will be examined in minute detail for evidence of prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, humility. But it doesn't matter how incredibly perfect her life may seem to mm -hmm. have been. There would still have to be two miracles attributed to her before she could become a saint. She will have to have two miracles of intercession. I'm sure a lot of people are praying to her right now. The only miracles that count toward sainthood are those that happen after the person is dead. You know why? Because in the New Testament, there are people who perform miracles, magicians and so forth. Who's to say that Satan didn't allow you to perform, to walk on water? You could walk to work on water every day and back again, and it wouldn't count at all for being a saint. Walking on water isn't considered to be a miracle. Well, it is considered to be a miracle, but you could perform miracles every day, and it wouldn't count. It only counts if after you perform a miracle after you're dead. After you're dead. Here's how it works. The church teaches that only God can perform miracles, but one way to reach him is through holy people who are believed to be in heaven. 
You pray to them, and they go to God on your behalf. The reason for the miracle is it's a sign from God you're on the right path. Yes, confirmation from God that uh, this is indeed, this person is indeed in heaven. Here in Rome, Brooklyn-born Monsignor Robert Sarno is the only American priest in the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, the 400-year-old Vatican agency that determines who will be recommended to the Pope for sainthood. We are offering to the people uh, a role model, if you will, as well as someone who indeed has intercessory power. The life stories of would-be saints from around the world are carefully gathered and stored in the Vatican's vast archives. There are thousands of cases, including that of Edith Stein, the Jewish convert credited with helping save the life of two-year-old Benedicta McCarthy. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that what the church is doing in canonization is not pinning a posthumous medal on somebody. What the church is doing is recognizing what God is saying. It used to be that a candidate needed up to four miracles for sainthood, but that's now changed. Why was the number of miracles reduced? Remember that old song, Is You Is or Is You Ain't, My Baby? Well, I mean, how many do you need? Today, a candidate needs two miracles to become a saint, except in the case of martyrs. They only need one. Traditionally, martyrdom meant directly laying down one's life for the faith. But in Edith Stein's case, the definition was expanded. She was one of 300 Jewish converts who in 1942 were rounded up just days after the bishops of Holland broke the church's silence and condemned the Nazi actions against the Jews. The converts were shipped to their deaths at Auschwitz. Theresia Benedicta von Kreuz, Edith Stein. More than 40 years later, in a huge papal ceremony, she was beatified as a martyr for her faith. But wasn't she still gassed because she was born Jewish? There are shades here. There certainly she was gassed because she had been Jewish. But she also was gassed because she had been a Jew who had become Catholic, and this was a retaliation against the Catholic bishops. In Rome, Father Simeon Tomas Fernandez had spent nearly 25 years promoting fellow Carmelite Edith Stein's case at the Vatican. Now that her status as a martyr was secured, his assistant, Father John Landy, says the next step was to find a miracle. Always you have people writing in saying, you know, I'm being cured of this or that, but <laughs> you have to select something that will stand up to a rigorous investigation. You don't want to present a case that's going to be turned down. I mean, you need to be fairly certain because even your own reputation lies at stake too in this. Benedicta McCarthy's incredible cure had been written up in a tiny Catholic newspaper in Maine. And that story eventually made its way to Rome. Thinking he might finally have his miracle, Father Simeon requested a formal church investigation to answer the crucial question. Did Edith Stein hear the prayers of the McCarthy family and ask God to cure Benedicta? Do you believe it was a miracle? Yeah. Why? I was dying and all of a sudden, like everyone praying and I got healed. I was like all better. The Vatican authorized an investigation. First step, witnesses were called before a Boston tribunal led by Monsignor Robert Dealey. So what's contained in here are all of the uh, collected documents that went to Rome. Over the course of three years, anyone with any knowledge of the events was interviewed in exhaustive detail. When a, uh, an investigation concerning a miracle comes to us, uh, because the, the, the faith of people is going to be grounded on this, the investigation uh, has to be done with, with, with rigor. And if we're going to say that this, this woman is to be held up as a saint, it is because we believe that there is something serious to look at here. Benedicta's older siblings were quizzed on every aspect of the incident. I'd say, okay, I saw a box of Tylenol up on the bed, right? And they'd say, okay, well, what's the label on the, on the box, right? And what color is the label? The ones responsible for the child were young college students, and their recall and, and memory uh, was done with difficulty. I don't really know. It's a box. <laughs> it was the box there, you know? Investigators continued to probe. Was it regular Tylenol or extra strength? 
How much Tylenol did Benedicta actually ingest? But that's, that's all important to know so that we're not dealing just with opinion, but rather with, uh, with some very firm statements that in fact this is what happened and it did happen through, the, uh, through prayer to uh, Blessed Edith Stein. That was the big thing, that we had all prayed to Edith Stein and that my parents had asked people and also that my parents had told us to tell others to pray to Edith Stein. Sworn testimony was also taken from experts in liver damage and child poisoning. Doctors who had overseen the case were also questioned, including Dr. Ronald Kleinman. Are you a religious person? I am not a particularly religious person, no. I am Jewish and, and, I'm, uh, and, I, and I identify with, uh, with my religion. Saints aren't part of my everyday life, uh, nor are miracles of, 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 of the religious sort. Finally, a 900-page document was bound, notarized, and shipped to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints in Rome. What was your opinion? That it was a, a miracle. You were sure of it? Sure. Pretty positive enough to say that the doctors should look at this, or at least that whatever my opinion might be worth, is that it would certainly give them a run for their money. Them is the Consulta Medica, a team of top doctors who meet at the Congregation for the Causes of Saints about 20 times a year. The church won't call any cure a miracle until the Consulta says there is no earthly reason for it. Here, the doctors scrutinize each case, searching for any possible scientific or medical explanation. Only about 40 cases a year make it this far. Of those, only about 15 are called inexplicable and each must meet a rigorous test, according to Chief Physician Dr. Raffaello Corazzini. It has to be quick, instantaneous. It An means instant cure? Yes. Matter of minutes, sometimes hour, not more. A minute or an hour? Yeah. What about Two hour, a week? What if it no, instantaneous. Sense? It means a, a, a tumor that disappears instantaneously. Matter of minutes. There's a time frame yeah, on a miracle? Yeah, sure, the time is very, very important. The first characteristic is the time. Okay, so if it's scientifically inexplicable and it's nearly instantaneous, what else does a miracle have to it's be? It's complete. It has to be complete. Complete recovery. Yeah, the, the pathology, the disease, has to disappear completely. Are all doctors on the Consulta Medica Catholic? Yeah. Every single one? Yeah and all believe in miracles. Well, I believe, I'm sure, yeah. In 1991, four years after Benedicta's cure, the Consulta reviewed the evidence gathered in Boston. On Benedicta's case, what was the vote? Was it a unanimous vote that it was a miracle? Well, the first time, no. The first time, it was sus sus we suspended because uh, there are many, many doubts. The Consulta heard evidence that 95% of children who overdose on acetaminophen actually survive. Before they would call Benedicta's cure inexplicable, they had to be convinced her case was so extreme she should have been among the other 5%, those who die. Dr. Ronald Kleiman would need to be re-interviewed, but this time he would testify in person at the Vatican. I was impressed that the church explored the science um, and the medical aspects of this as carefully as, as um, they could be explored. How did you think the Catholic Church picked saints before all this? I didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a, a completely religious process. Uh, I figured that uh, somewhere in Rome there was a back room that a few priests gathered uh, periodically and uh, looked through the books. Said, and, hey, uh, how about E.S. How about Stein? this one? <laughs> That's right. Uh, and Did it matter to the Vatican at all when they were investigating this that you were or were not Catholic? I don't know. Um, the questions were very pointed and very direct. Uh, I think they really wanted to know what happens to children who uh, do get an excessive amount of acetaminophen. We call it Tylenol here. Um, do children usually die from this kind of poisoning? Was this an extraordinary case? And I didn't in any way uh, feel that the conclusion was uh, foregone. Kleinman was questioned for over five hours on all particulars of the case. Finally, was there anything at all that could rationally explain the spontaneous recovery of Benedicta's liver? 
as the doctor involved in this case, you can think of, at this time, no scientific explanation for her recovery. I don't have an explanation for her recovery, that's right. Is it possible we just don't know it yet? Absolutely. Is it possible she did survive only through the grace of God? Yes. Do you believe it was a miracle? Um, I'm, I'm very willing to say it was miraculous. Um, and perhaps that's a way of, of, of not answering your question. Of hedging your bet. Of hedging my bet. The Consulta Medica was convinced. So was the Congregation for the Causes of Saints and eventually the Pope. In 1997, 55 years after Edith Stein's death, 10 years after Benedicta McCarthy was instantaneously cured of liver failure, the church made it official. This was a miracle. In his nearly 20-year reign as Pope, John Paul II has canonized nearly 300 saints and beatified nearly 800 others as a final step before sainthood. The miracle investigators have been working overtime. Under Pope John Paul II, there has been an extraordinarily high number of people beatified and canonized as saints. He's, What's going on? He's beatified and canonized more people than all his 20th century predecessors put together. There's nothing that binds Catholics in a local community to the, to the, both to the Church Universal and to the Holy Father as symbol of unity than having your own saint. Somebody you can relate to. Exactly. Who spoke your language. Exactly. But not everyone wants one of their own made into a Catholic saint. In the case of Edith Stein especially, there has been criticism. Why sanctify, why beatify someone who converted? Why the need to do that? Abraham Foxman heads the Anti-Defamation League and is one of the Pope's most ardent Jewish supporters. This Pope has engaged in so many firsts in Catholic-Jewish relationship. This Pope has almost stood Catholic-Jewish relationship on its head. Uh, and he's had the courage to say that anti-Semitism is a sin, a sin, a sin in, in, in theology and Catholicism. But even Foxman is disturbed by the decision to make Edith Stein a saint. Do you think by canonizing Edith Stein, Pope John Paul is sending a message to Jews that it is good that they should convert to Catholicism? I think some people in the Vatican and in the church hope that that's the message that they're sending. But they're also sending the message to non-Jews that there is this higher level of uh, for Jews to attain, and that's the level of conversion in Christianity. And that's a setback. That's a rollback. We're talking about Inquisition. Uh, what was the Inquisition all about? Saying to Jews, you cannot live amongst us as Jews. If you want to live, you have to convert. The Edith Stein controversy even spread to the place of her death, Auschwitz. In the mid-80s, her order, the Carmelite nuns, put a convent just outside the walls of the death camp in memory of Edith Stein and other Catholics who were killed there. Give us back our holy place. In the wake of Jewish protests, it was moved. Today, little remains at the site of her death but the ruins of the gas chamber itself. I would never diminish the way the Holocaust consumed European Judaism and the fact that the Holocaust was directed by and large at Jewish people. But Sister Teresa Benedicta converted to Catholicism of her own free will. There was no coercion there. In my view, the church is acknowledging someone who made major contributions, and I don't see that diminishing Judaism at all. I see it acknowledging one person's contributions. Sister Teresa Benedicta is not the only unlikely candidate for sainthood these days. John Paul II, the most well-traveled pope in history, has honored Catholic figures in countries that are not often associated with the church. An African nun killed in Zaire, martyrs in Korea, Japan, and Nigeria. In fact, many people say Pope John Paul II has been incredibly savvy politically when it comes to canonizing people, that he understands that it's a way to bring people into the tent. Is that what you think he's doing? No, I don't think that's true at all, as a matter of fact. I can't help but think that those thoughts couldn't cross his mind. 
but I don't see those thoughts in perhaps as cynical a way as some people might, as if it were a political chess game. In 1987, the Pope made an unprecedented appearance before thousands of Native Americans in Arizona, welcoming many of their religious customs into Catholic practice, and even honoring one of their own as a blessed member of the church. Kateri Tekakwitha was a 17th century Mohawk Indian convert, now considered by the Pope to be one of the founding pillars of the church in North America. He has set the stage for Kateri to become the first Native American saint. All she needs now is a miracle. And in Binghamton, New York, something happened to John Colligan, a local superintendent of Catholic schools that just might meet the test. In November of 1996, at age 59, he received a devastating diagnosis, a rare cancer called angiosarcoma. A surgeon had told me that I would have radical neck dissection surgery. What that amounts to is to cut underneath the ear, down under the chin, down the neck, and across the shoulder blade. Lay that open and remove whatever was found in there that looked cancerous. The voice box could go, rib sections could go, you know, shoulder blades could go. In fact, the surgery was only meant to extend Colligan's life a few months, but he and his wife Kathy decided that wasn't good enough. They began to pray to Blessed Cattery. As Catholics growing up in upstate New York, they had heard about the Mohawk convert all their lives. To us, it made no difference that Cattery was from a different culture. I look at her as a local girl. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, and she walked the same path that we often walk, and he had a tremendous faith. The story goes that Kateri converted to Catholicism as a young girl and was ostracized by her tribe. It was said that when she died, her face, scarred by smallpox, suddenly became smooth and beautiful. Father John Pere, who was stationed at the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in upstate New York, is on a mission to find a miracle that can be attributed to Cattery. You can call me her public relations man. The better known she is, the more chance there is that somebody will pray to the Lord through her for a, some sort of cure. In recent years, Father Pere has sent four potential miracles attributed to Cattery to the Vatican. All were rejected. While we certainly understand your disappointment, I hope and trust that you will understand also our position and we cannot do anything further than we did. But a new case came to his attention when Kathy Colligan called one of his colleagues at the shrine. Finally, he just said to me, Mrs. Colligan, what are you asking of us? And I just said, frankly, Father, we need a miracle. And with that, he got very enthused and very supportive. And he said, uh, well, you know, all right. Maybe we can help you. The priest told her they would say a special mass and bless her husband with relics of Cattery's life. The shrine holds several such relics, including a bit of cloth said to be part of her robe, even a tiny chip of her bone. Even in our own day, people like to get part of the clothing even of people whom they, whom they like very much and admire. So here, this is a part of her body, and they think this has to be to a certain extent holding in itself because it was a part of this person who was so holding. And the priest held it and brought it over and touched it against my neck in the spot where the cancer was and just prayed and asked Cattery to intercede in this healing request. The only thing I can say is, is that a peacefulness came over our family and a sense of greater hope in terms of what this was all about. But otherwise, nothing dramatic, you know, no lightning struck and uh, no, no music, nothing. Uh, very quiet and peaceful. But Colligan wasn't through. He heard Maria Esperanza, the Venezuelan faith healer, was meeting with the faithful in New Jersey, and Colligan got in line to see her. What she told him was startling. She says, there isn't anything wrong with you. God is watching over you. And I, my conclusion is, I was healed already by the time I got there. And so we then traced it back to the blessing with the relic of Cattery at the shrine. When Colligan arrived at the hospital, he had a message for his surgeon. I want you to be very, very cautious and conservative because you're not going to find anything when you go in there. And I'm sure he's thinking to himself, you know, all the nuts say things like this, right? Uh, so in we went, and it was six and a half hours of surgery. 
and uh, they took out 27 lymph nodes and sent them to the pathology lab. And then back came the report, uh, item by item. You know, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer, no cancer. Father Perret has already sent Colligan's medical records to the Vatican, but he knows the Consulta Medica won't even review the case until the cancer has been gone for 10 full years. But John Colligan, the man who was told he'd be dead at 59, recently celebrated his 61st birthday. He is convinced it was a miracle. I thought, I never see springtime again, I never see summer again, I never see flowers. And, uh, and I mean, today being another birthday, uh, a birthday that uh, is a gift from God because it should have not happened. They should have been dead. Benedicta McCarthy, the Massachusetts girl whom the Catholic Church believes was saved by a miracle, will enter high school this fall. Sometimes are you a little embarrassed by all this attention? Yeah. The fact that you are named after this person. Is there anything about her that you want to emulate or do you want to have in your own life? Have you ever thought about being a nun? No. <laughs> no, I, I know some people who like, um, you know, who don't really believe in God or whatever. But um, it seems like when this comes up or something similar to this, it's more like they become quiet. You know, and just kind of like, oh, okay, let's not say anything, you know? I believe in miracles. It's kind of um, an odd feeling knowing that you were in the room when some of this divine intervention might have been taking place. And that you might be hopefully blessed from, you know, get some offshoot blessing from it. If all goes as planned, this October, St. Peter's Square will be filled with thousands of the faithful who are certain that miracles occur, watching as Pope John Paul II canonizes Edith Stein a saint. <laughs>